I'll turn it over to Chairman Costa for a few remarks, then we'll have the members and the staff uh, introduce themselves. Oh, sorry. Sorry about that. Uh, <laughs> wrong mic. Um, you know, we make decisions, and it's good to get the feedback to find out how those decisions actually impacted the business, not just our side, but also your side, too. So I'm anxious to hear um, what you all have to say. So thank you for letting us be here. Okay, thank you. And if I just have a friendly reminder, if everyone could put their phones either turned off or on silent as we move forward, or submerge it in water, that will also yeah. keep it quiet, I've figured out. Um, and we'll just start uh, all the way to my right, if we just have all the members and staff introduce themselves. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Craig Statz, representing the 145th District in Bucks County. And I'm Representative Frank Burns. I represent the 72nd District in Cambria County. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Jeff Wheeland, uh, 83rd District, Williamsport. Uh, we're just uh, about ready to open up another small brewery, New Trail Brewery in Williamsport. And a little bit of my history, I was a former beer wholesaler and then beer retailer uh, in my previous life. So again, I'm looking forward to the testimony and I appreciate everyone uh, uh, participating. So I'm uh, Warren Kampf, I'm the actual the state rep for uh, this area. We're in the 157th district today. I want to thank the committee and the chairman for agreeing to uh, host the hearing uh, here. Um, I'm very proud of this, uh, this excellent town that we have, the, the borough of Phoenixville. It's um, undergone quite a transformation really because of the uh, town fathers and mothers working very hard to, to make that happen over the last 20 to 25 years. And uh, the, the latest developments with uh, craft brewing and, and distilling uh, coming to the town are very interesting. And so me being on the committee, it made sense that, uh, that I would ask the, the chairman to, um, to take a look at doing, doing a hearing here. And I, I would be remiss if I didn't thank the borough for allowing us to, uh, to host this uh, hearing here. We have the mayor. Mayor Urschler is, is back there to the left. Thank you very much, Mayor, for allowing us to be here and have the, have the hearing in this hall. Uh, ditto, thank you, Mayor. I did type in Phoenixville Borough Hall and it took me to a boarded up building a few blocks away, which kind of concerned me, but this is actually very, a very nice setting. And uh, I'm Representative Adam Harris. Uh, I represent the 82nd District, so I'm in the center part of the state, uh, Juniata, Franklin, and Mifflin counties. Uh, good afternoon again, everybody. Um, my district is part of the city of Pittsburgh and its eastern suburbs in Allegheny County. And again, look forward to being here and what you all have to say. Hi, I'm Lynn Banco Davies. I'm with, I'm with Representative Paul Costa as Executive Director for the Liquor Control Committee. Mike Biaki, House Liquor Control Committee for uh, Rep Harris. Okay, with no, well, I guess we're all ready to get started. So first off, we have a panel with the Brewers of Pennsylvania. If we could just have you each introduce yourself and then you can begin with your written testimony at your leisure. May it please the House Liquor Committee. Uh, Attorney Ted Zeller, um, General Counsel to the Brewers of Pennsylvania and uh, counsel to actually to several of the breweries in this uh, great town of Phoenixville. You're absolutely right. It's kind of been a hotbed for craft beer and I, I think it's uh, serving the, uh, the, the town well. I want to thank you for uh, asking us to come here today. I'm Chris Lampy, uh, president of the Brewers of Pennsylvania, uh, as well as co-owner of, uh, of um, Weyerbacher Brewing Company in uh, Easton, Pennsylvania. I'm just tickled to be here. Thank you for having me. Uh, I'm Mark Sofia with Crowded Castle Brewing Company, uh, one of the uh, new breweries here in Phoenixville. Uh, and we are happy to be here and, uh, and happy to share our, our story and uh, insights with you. So I'll get started without any further ado. Um, as I said, I'm the president of the Brewers of Pennsylvania, uh, as well as a part owner of uh, Weyerbacher Brewing Company. Brewers of Pennsylvania is a nonprofit organization which is comprised of and supports Pennsylvania breweries, which believe in the nobility of brewing and hold dear the great traditions and history of Pennsylvania brewing. 
BOP members employ an estimated 10,000 employees earning uh, 296 million in wages and generating 1.1 billion in direct economic benefits to communities throughout the Commonwealth. Despite these numbers, we believe the Pennsylvania brewing industry can grow more further uh, through further analysis of recent legislative changes and further promotion of the brewing industry in the Commonwealth. The BOP has approximately 170 members throughout the Commonwealth and once again, thanks the uh, House Liquor Committee for this opportunity to testify today. While Acts 39 and 166 did change the legislative landscape in which we must operate, there was a regulatory change in uh, 2015 which created the ability of breweries to operate tap rooms at their facilities. This was a groundbreaking event which allowed breweries to promote their own products at their own facilities and gave breweries the opportunity to differentiate their products from what is becoming a crowded field of offerings. The number of breweries in the United States has grown from a couple of hundred breweries in the late 1980s to uh, just over 6,000 presently. Uh, the, the ability to differentiate our products at tap rooms allows us to sell more beer throughout the industry through our industry partners and at the wholesale level. And I can speak to that from my own tap room, which opened, uh, we, when, when that regulation changed in 2015, we uh, were actually giving away our beer <laughs> and uh, <laughs> for free. Uh, and uh, we, went from, we went from sales in our tap room, uh, which was just a visitor center at that point, of just over $500,000 to uh, the following year, sales uh, tipped out at about 1.2 million. So it was a huge, it was a huge uh, benefit for just my brewery alone and, and many other breweries throughout the state. Acts 39 and 166 made historic changes to the Pennsylvania Liquor, Control, Liquor Code and provided for such things as wine sales to go for grocery and convenience stores, less restrictions on convenience stores which also sell liquid fuels obtaining liquor licenses, and permitting Pennsylvania manufacturers, including breweries, the ability to secure, secure exposition permits and farmer's market permits. It also created a, a malt, yeah, Excuse me. It also created a Pennsylvania Malt Beverage Promotion Board, and the Brewers of Pennsylvania submitted a project proposal and grant application to the board last year entitled Retail Impact of Acts 166 and 39 of 2016 on Malt and Brewed Beverage Sales. I'll refer to it as the project from here on out. The project focused on five primary areas of research precipitated by the changes of Acts 166 and 39 as follows. Number one, what are the effects of the new legislation on malt and brew beverages sales within the Commonwealth? What is the impact of wine expanded permits have had on malt and brew beverages sales within the Commonwealth? What effects have wine expanded permits had on floor space in retail at outlets in the Commonwealth? What is the effect of the new retail privileges at manufacturing locations, excuse me, what effect that new real retail privileges at manufacturing locations have had on beer sales? And finally, number five, are manufacturers able to adequately access distribution channels from for malt beverages to new entrances to the marketplace created by the new legislation? We proposed that a well-known consulting firm conduct the project, and we received a letter of support from our national association, referred to as the Brewers Association, for the project, and an endorsement of Bump Williams Consulting, the third-party consultant which we suggested conduct the project. As you may know, I'm also a member of that uh, malt beverage promotion board, and unfortunately, the project was rejected by the board. I should also note that uh, because I am uh, the president of the BOP and uh, a member of that board, I recused myself from that vote uh, on the Malt Beverage Promotion Board. While I'm here to test, uh, today to testify uh, pursuant to your invitation concerning the effects of Act 39 and 166, please excuse my and the BOP's ignorance of a better assessment of this new legislation uh, since we didn't have the, um, the project passed. Uh, we did propose a survey to our brewers and are happy to share the results. However, we believe that such a project such as the one proposed by the Brewers of Pennsylvania may be a more appropriate assessment of the effects of the new acts. The members of the Brewers of Pennsylvania that responded to our survey indicated that only about 14% of their current sales on average were for other Pennsylvania wine or spirits which breweries can sell under the new acts. This is a strong indicator that the focus of breweries' tap rooms remains their own products. Approximately 90% of the members that responded enjoyed the benefits of, of exposition permits or farmers' markets permits. 
and they believe it did increase their overall profitability as well. More members believe the fact that convenience stores can sell, their, sell beer would not positively affect their sales. I believe that this is because many small brewers do not have the opportunity to gain shelf space in smaller convenience stores, which are typically dominated by larger brewers. We must always keep in mind that ABI and Miller Coors dominate the market and sell more than 80% of the beer produced within the United States. My, bre my brewery is very small in comparison, uh, and we do have a difficult time of obtaining shelf space in convenience stores. One of our larger members, DG Yingling & Son Incorporated, even struggles to keep with the likes of ABI and Miller Coors. While many of our breweries are growing almost 20%, almost 20% reported that their distribution to other retailers was negatively affected in the year 2017 as evidence of the small nature of many of our members. 50% of them reported that the $700 license surcharge fee negatively affected their operations by at least a moderate amount. As mentioned above, the Malt Beverage Promotion Board was created by the, act, the new acts, but it rejected our project request that would go beyond what I am able to relate to you today. It did, however, grant the BOP funding for a brewery locator ap application. Again, I would like to thank the committee for the opportunity to be here today. The Brewers of Pennsylvania believe there is still more work uh, to do when it comes to analyzing the effects of the new acts and to increase opportunities for the brewing industry to grow in the Commonwealth. We still hear too many stories from our members that they can be handcuffed by perpetual agreements and case minimums for delivery to retailers. And I can offer a person, personal anecdote on that one. I have uh, uh, just not, and some of you have heard this before, but uh, I have a bar uh, marginally within walking distance of where I live that happens to be on the, um, uh, the wrong side of Berks County for the wholesaler that I happen to work with there, and they refused to, uh, they refused to take the beer to the bar. Um, so I can't actually have my own beer at a bar that's close to me. Uh, so what I actu actually end up doing instead is self-deliver uh, to them. But the interesting part about self-delivery, as far as that's concerned, is st I, still have to run, uh, I still have to run everything through the wholesaler that I use for that area, which means that even though I have delivered the product myself, they get their cut anyway. So that's one of the hamstrings <laughs> that we can run into. In any case, uh, we remain open to working with the committee on solutions, and I'm happy to take questions that you have at this time. Wonderful. Thank you very much, and thank you for mentioning the surcharge. I did want to note uh, there are several representatives from the VFW and the Legion, if you could raise your hands. <clears throat> uh, they're similarly reporting problems with this, the $700 surcharge, especially for the smaller clubs. And I know we've got to, we got to talk in the hallway a little bit, and some of the other members did. But I would like to ask all the members before you leave today if you could take a few minutes just to hear their concerns uh, going forward. Chairman Costa. No questions. Any questions from the members? Yes, Representative Wheeland. Uh, thank you again for your testimony. And you had mentioned increased opportunities. Um, approximately once a month, the UPS driver comes to my door and I have to sign for the three bottles of wine that my lovely bride gets delivered. And my question is, uh, for these, uh, you know, the small brewers, would internet sales be something that, that you would be interested in discussing further with the committee? Yeah, absolutely. Sure. With <clears throat> franchise laws, um, alternative methods of distribution to consumers are very welcome and stuff we actually look at. And in fact, as of right now, under the law, as long as a brewery has a named a wholesaler, um, a primary meaning exclusive territorial rights, and you being in the wholesale business, you know exactly what it is, they can actually conduct internet sales as long as they deliver it to that consumer or use a third party shipper like a UPS or something like that. They can do it now already. And some of them are thinking about um, um, actually um, starting to take more advantage of it because it's a recent phenomenon. Representative Camp. Mr. Lampy, um, you indicated the, um, it's the sale of other products uh, in, uh, um, you know, in your members' establishments and tap rooms. Was it 17% of them uh, reported that they were 
they were selling wine or spirits from another source? It's a product mix. Uh, product mix, uh, 14%. Uh, 14%. Product, product, product mix. So, uh, le so essentially less than 15% of sales within the tap room is something other than the product uh, that the manufacturer uh, makes. And then you, you indicated right after that another statistic, um, whether it was 9% or 90, I, I didn't quite catch that. 90% of the members responded that they uh, uh, enjoyed the benefits of exposition permits uh, or farmer's markets permits. Okay, so for the benefit of the folks in the audience or people watching, this is, this is the right of your members to uh, several times a year go to a, a farmer's market or a taste of Phoenixville, for example. And sell product at, at those, yes. Okay. Um, all right, and 90% of your constituents or your uh, members are using that in one form or another. Uh, what, I, what I would say there is that 90% uh, of the uh, members that reported back. Okay, okay. And I, just your own personal experience or, or talking with folks, what is the value of that uh, that particular reform? It, it's a it's a an increase for for me for uh, I'll speak to my brewery. Uh, we have used two farmers markets over the course of 2017. Uh, it increased exposure uh, for us. Um, uh, amazingly enough, my business has been in, in uh, we've been we've been in business for 23 years now, uh, and in the Easton area, there are still people that have no idea that we exist in Easton. Um, you know, we're 17,000 barrels a year and have existed for 23 years. You'd think there would be more people that understand that, we're, that we are there. Uh, so that just gets, you know, using the farmer's markets for that gets us greater exposure um, for the business itself uh, as, well, as well as some sales. Members have questions? I have a few. Uh, I was curious. I didn't realize that your proposal to the beer board was rejected. Was that a close vote or was it... Was it a financial issue, or I, I actually, because I recused myself, I can't, I, I can't really speak to it. I'm not sure what the machinations were uh, okay. behind, well, we'll, behind we'll it. Okay, we'll do some digging and, and figure out what that vote was. And I do know it wasn't a financial issue because I think there's still money on the table, enough to still cover the proposal. Interesting. Yeah, the, the, the Malt Beverage Promotion Board uh, gave uh, recommended to to the PLCB uh, just over seven hundred thousand dollars worth of grants. So uh, of the million, there's still still from 2017 some to be to be good if, if you don't mind i'd like to turn our attention to mark if you would maybe mind just telling us a little bit about what your experience was like starting a brew are you here in phoenixville absolutely okay yep. if you could just tell us sort of the good and the bad you know what was maybe easy what was more difficult the the problems that you came across as you um started your operation sure um we first of all i just want to say thank you for having me here thank you to borough phoenixville uh the brewers association of pennsylvania they have laid the groundwork that made what we do possible uh in fact before 2015 we had uh we were a group of home brewers who thought maybe we should share our beer uh, as most home brewers do and uh, so we decided to investigate it and after years a couple of years of investigating we thought well let's look into it and at that time uh, the tap room wasn't uh, a part of the ability for breweries, and so you were looking at uh, just straight uh, distribution model, uh, which changes everything. It's it's a you have to have a bigger uh, space, uh, your bigger brew system, uh, more likely in a warehouse. Now, if Weyerbacher considers themselves a small brewery, I don't know what word to use for what we are. Um, but when the, when the laws changed in 2015, we'd actually done contract brewing before that to experiment uh, with that, and so became very familiar with the, uh, the three-tiered system and how that works and all the, the regulations and rules around that. Uh, but when in 2015, when the, when the laws changed, we decided, hey, this is, this is a whole new game for us. It, it, it allows us, um, uh, one of the things we'd always kind of wanted was a destination brewery, some place that people would come to that was a, you know, when you go to the, uh, wineries you know they have a beautiful place to drink beautiful wine and uh, so many of the breweries now at that time were basically warehouses with tasting rooms on them and and, and while it was fun to go there they, they didn't have that same kind of feel that the wine people had the edge on so in 2015 when that changed that allowed us to come to phoenixville on a fluke it's a bit of a haircut story but um 
we came to Phoenixville and, and had the opportunity not only to put ourselves right in the midst of, of a historic community uh, and a great place to do business, uh, but also to create a, a, what we think is a kind of a beautiful space for uh, people to come in and experience our products. So we think that that's also a, a big part of um, how we can identify or differentiate ourselves is, you know, we have five, basically five breweries in Phoenixville represented and each one has a different vibe, if you will, to it, which kind of meshes up with uh, what their twist and take on beer is. And so it gives the consumer an opportunity to uh, see the differentiation between uh, the breweries. So we, we came to Phoenixville. Um, we uh, found this location and uh, we, we completely gutted it. We found the, the original wall from 1913, which we've retained back in the brewery, and we've built upon that. And Phoenixville is a tremendously, uh, gloriously historic town. And so it's kind of fun for us to say that we're building on the, the past uh, to do something uh, new today. And um, so we have, a, we have a seven and a half barrel brewery system. Um, which is probably smaller than their test barrel system. Um, and uh, we have a, a tap room that sits about 85 even, people. Even Miller Coors and, and Budweiser started small. <laughs> they so did, they there's did. always room they to did. grow. Yes, yes. Um, we have about 85 seats and, uh, and a, a bar. I will say to the uh, comments about the wine and the spirits, now it might be just Phoenixville itself, but we have, our, I think our numbers are higher. Um, but uh, that's maybe because there's a distillery in town. But we have really uh, appreciated, grown, and, and had a wonderful time networking with the different wineries and the different distilleries. And so we actually become, it, it, I always think of it as a Pennsylvania proud moment. I get to tell their stories. I get to tell the story of Dad's Hat down in Bristol, of, of you know, a Paradox Winery uh, out in, in uh, way up in Chester County. Um, but we, you know, it, so, and they know us and they tell our story. And so it's been an opportunity for us to kind of uh, begin to think about maybe ways we can work together on that. So I, I don't know that that was really the intention of it. Uh, but from the business side, it has made us much more competitive in the sense that um, we are able to offer uh, drinks that, uh, that's, we have people come in and you know, they're, they're uh, significant others, they, their friends don't drink beer and they really don't like wine and cider's too tart for them. And you know, do you have, is there, do you sell cocktails? And so we've been able to, it's not like your primary thing, but it's what, what your friends come in that allow you to come in uh, uh, to the brewery. So we found that to be very helpful, uh, both in uh, uh, promoting ourselves, but also in, in bringing people in to have that ability to do that, to meet the needs of, of people. Because people come in, beer drinkers are community. Right, I mean, they usually come in in groups, um, and so not everybody's the same. Um, we've been, we will be open a year in May uh, 26th coming up, so we, we are really brand new. I think that the, the legislation that, that uh, you've done in Act 39 has been wonderful. It's opened a lot of doors for us, a lot of conversations. It's, made, it's actually made what we do possible and feasible and, and economically viable. So um, I'm just really grateful uh, for all the work that, that this committee has done, uh, for all the work that the Brewers Association has done, and they do a great job educating people. I mean, I went to their, uh, their uh, symposium. symposium, and it was marvelous. It was so helpful. I, I think one of the challenges for small breweries like us is that we don't have a lot of people to throw a lot of different tasks at, so when we can go to some place uh, like their symposium and, and just take in a whole lot of uh, of information about the laws, about what's right. I mean, I remember that people were talking about uh, overtime, you know, and that was, that was a big issue. So I'm very grateful for them uh, that they're, they continue to be supportive. But uh, I have nothing but thanks and praise for you guys for, for the work you've done and, and deep appreciation, which is why I'm tickled to be here, because if you hadn't done that, I wouldn't be here. And I'm just curious, at this point, are you strictly self-distributing your beer, or? Oh, we, I'm sorry, I just stole Paul, Paul's question. I got Yes, um, we, we, currently, we are self-distributing. We are in talks with a, dis, uh, a distributor who uh, does small brands uh, to get us. We're finding that that's important for a variety of reasons. Ability just to uh, move beer so that we can turn over beer, uh, as well as, as we grow in, in developing 
uh, our styles and the kinds of beer to, to be able to uh, experiment that way. Chairman Costa, that's what happens when you have two Penguins fans working <laughs> together. Our brains <laughs> Great are just think synced. alike, right? Uh, yeah, I was going to ask about the self-distribution also, but uh, but since I have you, I want to thank you for the comments. It's not very often that we get praised for things that we do. We usually get criticized. So <laughs> it's good to hear. It, but thank you. But if I can go back to Chris, um, you do have an, at least one ID, or did you have multiple? I have one ID. So uh, can you go into again about crossing the county line, or if it is the boundary was the county line? Is that the issue that your distributor had? It, 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 it is. It is purely with with my distributor. With that distributor, it, it is purely that uh, he just doesn't. It, it's it's one bar at the complete opposite end of the county, uh, and and he doesn't want to spend the time to deliver you know a couple of kegs here and there to that bar. So is that if you wanted to, would that be a reason to get out of your contract? General, that that is a, a pretty good distributor. Um, I, I don't think we'd look to get out of the contract. I think there are other ways around that. Um, you know, with with also case minimums are, are another issue that comes up periodically. Um, I know that uh, Victory has had issues uh, with a winery that is very close to their uh, new facility, uh, and the to get their beer distributed to that winery is almost impossible because they only want one or two cases, and the distributor won't as a case minimum uh, for dealing with that. And I think, I think you know, we've, we've talked uh, about some possible legislative fixes to that, which would just simply be if you have a case minimum, then we can go distribute it ourselves and not have to run it through the, the distributor. Okay. All right. Thank you, Chris. Yeah. One, go ahead. If I may, to piggyback on, on one thing that Mark said, uh, I, uh, quick story about a, a, bar, uh, a bar owner that I spoke with years and years ago up in New York City. Um, he, he was, it was a craft beer bar um, called the Stone Pony, and he had a couple of really interesting business models with it, but I, he, he, he focused specifically on craft beer, excepting he carried Bud Light. And I looked at him, and this would be almost 10 years ago, I looked at him and said, why, you know, you're, you're focused all on the craft beer, why, why would you carry the Bud Light? He looked at, he looked at me and said, I do two things with it. With it. I charge more for it, <laughs> <laughs> uh, number one. And number two, if there are three businessmen that want to go out to lunch, two of them like craft beer, one of them isn't into it at all, I just lost, lost three customers. So uh, having, having the ability to, to add in a little bit of wine and a little bit of spirits into each and every tap room does exactly the same thing. That is, if there are three, pe three people and one person isn't into beer, we lost three customers. But doing it that way, I, I will tell you too that I, I also represent some distillers and wineries who've had rooms and all of them after those acts saw immediate upticks in sales of 25% or so just because you, the ability to offer that little bit of variety um, made the, you know, the two couples going out to dinner where the one insisted on having a glass of wine or a spirit or something like that then they could go to that facility. I, I, I've seen it across the industry that I think that was a very positive thing. And I, I still think, though, what's important is that all of those manufacturers are maintaining their goals of really promoting their own products. That in a place like Phoenixville, where your product mix might be a little bit higher because of the partnerships, I don't think it really invades um, the equity that a lot of license holders have in their, in their licenses, because it's just a way of almost promoting their own brands, and hopefully then they go to that fine restaurant and ask for that brand and everybody wins. Representative Camp. Um, I asked this of Mr. Lampy. What about the um, the taste of Phoenixville and those sorts of events? Do you utilize that at all, or yes. and has that been useful for you? Yeah, I I think as was pointed out, it's it's really a lot of marketing and uh, getting getting people to know who you are. Um, I, I, but we go to all of them. Um, I think it's, it, it, as a brewer, it helps us to be in contact with what people are drinking and what they like, and, and sometimes you get ideas, but it is something advantageous for us um, for marketing purposes. Okay. Um, and I, I, I know a, a couple of years ago we put a tax credit in for um, the purchase of equipment. Right. Uh, at, has that been utilized at all, or? Uh, we have plans to. <laughs> yeah, it just started, the program just started. You're just seeing the first returns filed because it wasn't funded for a while, and then they have to write the procedures on it. 
Um, as with many tax credit legislations, uh, when, after they're passed, it takes a year or two actually to get up and running. So we're just starting on that. Okay. And then just w one last thing. If you, with Mark's here, but there, there are several others. Uh, Concha Hock and Brewing has just opened up a place, Stable 12, Sly Fox, uh, Root Down. Uh, and then, of course, we have a, a local distiller, um, Bluebird. So there's a, um, and a, a, I think Black Walnut uh, wine tasting room. So there's an incredible mix within really a block and a half or two blocks of where we're sitting. Has, has that been a, a catalyst? Has that been uh, a challenge? What, uh, can you talk about that? Yeah, I, I, when we first uh, leased the property, the, someone posted on our website, great, one more brewery. Um, you know, and but what's happened is that uh, since uh, Root Down has gone in and and Kasha Haken has come in, what we find is is it actually works as a catalyst. There's a bigger uh, geographic area with, from which we can draw people, um, and so in the summertime and festival times, it's it's very big. But we found even even um, even in everyday kind of uh, weekend experiences, you know, uh, people will come in like. If you're from the area of Westchester, there's Levante Brewery in Westchester. People in Westchester love Levante it, it, with depths that I haven't yet experienced with Crowded Castle. Um, but they will come and, and they will come to Phoenixville because in that three block radius, there's, they got five breweries, three wine rooms and a distillery that they can walk up and down and, and pick and choose and taste and, and, uh, and visit. So we found it to be really a positive thing. Um, I, you know, as far as the brewers go, I think we all kind of get along. I have great respect for all of them. Uh, like I said, everybody's got their own little, little take on beer, and I think that actually helps people to understand the differences in the, in the breweries themselves. It's not just beer. It's Stable 12 has their take on it. Root Down has their take on it. Conshohocken, Iron Hill, they all have their takes on it. And Crowded Castle does as well. So um, I think it's a great thing. For us, it's been... I, um, so I, I feel very good about it. And we have been joined by Representative Tobash. Representative Tobash, if you'd like to give an introduction, you, he's been very actively involved in a lot of beer and liquor issues. If you'd just like to give a brief synopsis where you're from, you have a small brewer in your district, I believe. <laughs> and I'd like to see my friends here, Mr. Zeller Lampy. Nice to see you nice gentlemen see you. today. Sorry, I'm running a little bit late and uh, appreciate coming here to Phoenixville. Wow. What a great small town, and I noticed all of the microbreweries and pubs and everything on the way in here, and I think uh, you're building something that's really great. We've got a, a craft brewers um, caucus right now, and, and we're working consistent with, uh, with your mission uh, to grow Pennsylvania's manufacturing and tourist sector, uh, which you guys do all so well. Um, I think one of my friends up in Pottsville, I think it was Dave Casanelli, actually, he, he uh, coined the phrase and he said we should make Pennsylvania the um, the um, Napa Valley of beer so we're using that and uh, we're you know we're working for you so we appreciate having this hearing here but I am from the 125th district which includes Schuylkill County and uh, the home of Yingling beer so happy to be here today and happy to hear the testimony thank you mr. chairman Okay, seeing no other questions, I just want to say be, um, on behalf of the entire committee, thank you very much for your testimony. I think we might run into a few of you a little bit later, but thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, we have a panel from the Pennsylvania Distillers Guild. Good afternoon, gentlemen. The floor is yours whenever you're ready. Good afternoon, uh, Chairman Harris, Chairman Costa, and the distinguished members of the House Liquor Control Committee. I'm grateful for the time and opportunity you have granted me to discuss the effects of Act 39 and others issues that pertain to the Pennsylvania craft distilleries. The exact scheduling of today I find to be serendipitous as it was seven years ago on this very date April 4th, 2011, that I testified before the House Liquor Committee on House Bill 242. 
Costa, I see you smiling on it. <laughs> <laughs> this was the piece of legislation that later became the limited distillery license. At that time, Pennsylvania had the highest licensing fee for a micro distillery in the United States, with no distillery having the ability to sell product to tourists visiting their facilities. Today, the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania is touted as having some of the best legislation as it pertains to the industry. When I previously sat before you, I promised that allowing this barrier to entry to become modernized and competitive with the nation's landscape that we would create jobs. I am proud to say that we have gone from three to 82 distilleries in that time. The Commonwealth is ranked sixth nationally in number of distilleries within the state and ranked fifth nationally in growth with 34.7% growth from the previous year in number of craft distilleries. The trend of craft distilling has also triggered a growth in full-time employee jobs within the sector by 50% from 2014 to 2017. Approximately 66% of these jobs are created from the production facility and tasting room staff. Statistically, a craft distillery gets 34% of their total sales from direct-to-consumer activity through their tasting rooms, etc. In terms of quality, Pennsylvania was a state that garnered the most medals from the American Craft Spirits Association annual competition for the second year in a row. Pennsylvania distillers received 44 medals for their products that came from 11 different distilleries. For the record, that is 14 more medals than the second place state of New York. Pennsylvania's proud heritage of distilling and its symbiotic ties to the rich agriculture is having an unprecedented resurgence and able to do so on the back of the modernization this committee put forth seven years ago. Today I'm here to talk about the modernization as a result of Governor Wolf's signing of Act 39 on June 8, 2016. The bill changed more than 35 sections of the liquor code and added a number of new sections. Within this legislation, there were a number of positive things for limited distilleries. Like wineries, we are also now allowed to apply for permits to participate in farmers markets and other expositions. Representative Costa, we actually use these exposition permits at the ACSA conference that was held in Pittsburgh in your district this spring. Act 39 allowed Pennsylvania alcohol producers to cross promote and sell each other's products in our respective licensed facilities. We're all in this together and happy to promote our fellow Pennsylvania manufactured products. While the state has continued to make great strides, there are a few areas we would like to see addressed in future legislation or policy. As limited distilleries, we would like to see parity with the wine and beer marketing promotions boards that were created. Speaking for myself, as a Pennsylvania distiller and small business owner using the existing PLCB system, I have gained intimate knowledge on its functions. I believe small investments of administrative personnel in both the Department of Licensing as well, in, as well as category management will improve the working relationship with the board that a craft distiller, as well as any spirit supplier, faces. To give you an example, category manager that controls the spirits and the PLCB, that single buyer controls $1.1 billion worth of sales, has no administrative support, and manually enters the UPC codes of every single item that come into the system. That is an enormous weight and administrative hamper on being able to have continued listing periods throughout the year. When I first started my, my, my original distillery in 2005, we could go in for a listing about every other month. Now it's once a year at best. While the modernization has been fantastic and created a positive impact within the state, there has not been the minor investment into supporting the already overstretched personnel in these departments so that the intents can be fully realized, monetized, and regulated. Flexible pricing enable the state to renegotiate with suppliers and greatens its margins, but the allocation of personnel to perform this task was not added and the result has been painfully long turnaround times on new item submissions. Continually, I have found the members of the House Liquor Committee to be open to discussions on modernization of our code that makes sense in today's world. As legislators, I applaud the work you have done and look forward to continuing our working relationship to address the next steps. I thank the committee for its time and consideration today and happily, happily take any questions you might have. 
Wonderful. Thank you very much, Rob. Jared, you want to just uh, give us a little background on um, your business and um, how things have been going on, on your end? Thank you very much. My name is Jared Atkins. I'm from Bluebird Distilling uh, right here on the block um, in Phoenixville. So we started about three years ago. I uh, renovated an old building in town here with my father. And then we opened the doors three years ago as a tasting room and a full production facility. Um, so we operate as a tasting room on the block here and have regular hours where patrons can come in, try our spirits, have a cocktail. And then we also sell and distribute through Pennsylvania, Illinois, New Jersey, and Delaware now. So we do utilize a distribution system through the PLCB warehouses. And then also uh, we do a small amount of self-distributing. And as we've gotten larger, it's been uh, nice for us to kind of lean on the PLCB aspect of it to be able to distribute through stores as it's tough to keep up with as a small business of hand-to-hand -hand deliveries. Uh, but it has been a great benefit from growing our business to the point where we could actually start going into the stores and utilize some of the state's um, attributes. Thank you very much. Questions from members? Chairman Costa. Thank you, Chairman. Um, Robert, I'm glad you brought up the Marketing Promotion Board. Actually, I have a bill, and Adam is one of the co-sponsors uh, to create that. Uh, we work very closely with Wiggle Whiskey in Pittsburgh, and I'm sure you know Mark. Um, but hopefully i got to convince the uh, chairman to run the bill when we get back in the session. <laughs> it certainly did not go unnoticed, Representative Costa, and we thank you very much. Uh, so the feedback you gave was, was very interesting, very helpful. I know we have been pushing the LCB about having a more modernized e-commerce system um, for everyone that uses the system. And I know they've been very receptive to that idea, but it obviously is a, is a cost issue, and they're trying to figure that out. Um, just curious, uh, what are, I mean, we were talking earlier about the surcharge fee. Do you pay the $700 surcharge as well, or is a limited distillery, what, what fees are you actually paying to the Commonwealth? Uh, I guess my question would be more on, I'm not sure which fees I'm not paying. Okay. <laughs> so there are quite a few. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you mentioned about the e-commerce system. Um, that's another area I think is interesting is the category manager that handles that, the PLCB, I believe has grown that business from $48 million to nearly $500 million in the last 16 months. Um, again, same situation as the other person who does the $1.1 in sales, all manual data entry with no administrative support. Representative Camp. Guys, I have a couple of questions. Robert, um, maybe you mentioned it, but and I missed it. What, um, what percentage on the shelves in the state stores are there kind of craft distillers from Pennsylvania or, or what's going out their doors from your members? I think that the, uh, the board themselves has been great to delineate a section of select stores for PA made products. Um, that's the part that I think is great. But you know, going back to some of my other points about things, you know, not reaching a full level of execution, you know, you can go into some stores where you'll find the PA made uh, wine and spirits sitting over in the Italian wine section. Um, now statistically, a consumer who goes in to buy distilled spirits within the state of Pennsylvania stores spends roughly 49 seconds from the time they walk in the door to their buying decision. In a 49 second period, that means that we're asking a consumer to look on the opposite side of the store from what it is they're actually shopping for to find the small Pennsylvania made section. So those are areas where I say the intent was good, but they're, they need some other resources to better execute the system they have at hand. You know, I think that the, the state of Oregon recently put out some statistics about a sizable number of both SKUs and now percentage of the state's gross revenue that is coming from supporting its in-state spirits manufacturers. And do you, do you have or did you mention what our statistics are on Pennsylvania made or distilled uh, spirits going out their doors? So I actually did have that as my intent to put in there today, but interestingly enough, um, certain sections or listing uh, categories within the state, um, unlike the regular listing channel, are not made publicly and easily available. Okay. So that includes even my own products. Okay. Um, and Jared, I had a, a couple of questions for you um, very quickly. One, the uh, you mentioned the kind of the the front of the house in in your facility, the uh, the bar. Um, is, is that a, a big part of your business? Uh, how does it help you? 
Sure. And uh, I'll touch on that first, then I'll actually go back and talk about some of the uh, Pennsylvania uh, in, with, inside the liquor stores I have some good comments on. Um, so thankfully for us, we started at a time three years ago where it was already, we were already able to actually be able to serve patrons at our, at our tasting room, per se, um, but to actually make cocktails and make drinks and be able to serve them some of our spirits. Uh, what that did for us is give us a huge leap of having income in our pocket and allowing our business to actually succeed. Um, so with that aspect, if we didn't have that, it would have been nearly impossible to be able to go through the Pennsylvania Liquor Control Board chain, and I'll talk about that in a second why. Um, so that gave us money directly. We opened our doors. We had an instant kind of uh, local crowd from Phoenixville, which is fantastic, um, but we were able to actually make money right away. Uh, and with that money, I was able to hire personnel. I was able to help you know, get a distiller, free myself up to actually go out there and start making sales. Um, to this point, and we're starting to sell much more volume throughout uh, different states, but our tasting room probably still goes for about 75% of our profit, um, which is huge that. And that's floating a staff of 10 to 14 and with seven full-time people now as well, um, all out of just being able to have a location. And again, with our self-distribution and new products, we're able to uh, come up with new products and actually offer them directly to customers right there instead of waiting for the chain for Pennsylvania's um, state stores. And then Warren, I'll, I'll touch real quick and um, about what Rob was just saying. So some of our problems or some of our uh, kind of story when we went into the state stores was um, we put in for the original 10 stores program, which is fantastic that Pennsylvania came up with this uh, aspect that craft distilleries without going through the hustle and bustle of putting in twice a year, you can put in for 10 stores and get up to 10 products in 10 stores. Fantastic. We pick our stores, so local ones. Um, so a great first set. The only problem that we ran into was, first off, it took 11 months for those products even to get into the stores from the date of actually putting in. Um, the second problem is that once we hit those 10 stores and we started selling well, there was no plan of how do we get above 10 stores. Because with a growing business that we're putting a lot of money into, obviously 10 stores can't really support um, a growing business. So we have worked past that, and we're up to now about 120 stores without the, with, within the state. Um, but I've kind of championed um, a lot of this PA section over the last year and a half, mostly due to problems that I've dealt with. and been very vocal in visiting the uh, Liquor Control Board and working with Ron Murphy on trying to get this resolved. Um, so the Liquor Control Board put in this fantastic Pennsylvania section, able to showcase Pennsylvania products and get us attention. As Rob stated, in every single store, it is 98% in the wine section, which is on the left side of the store, and the spirits tend to be on the right side of the store. Um, with that, the general sales through there is somebody goes in their respective category and picks out a product and chooses, um, not really thinking that or knowing that the Pennsylvania corner is around there. Um, the second huge problem we ran out with that is that all Pennsylvania distilleries would go in and majority of the time our products were not on the planogram for the actual stores and they were only put in the PA section. So imagine going into a store and they're saying, hey, we got you over here, great, but then somebody can't find your products on the shelf and they go to grab another product. So I spent over a year working through that and actually bringing letters around from Ron Murphy and the heads itself, giving it to the managers, which 90% of the time was a huge problem and it was taken, they were pretty upset that I was giving them a letter that they had to actually put a product and it took maybe four or five times of following up on every single store to get the product placed on the respective shelf. I go back there three months later and all the products are back in the actual um, Pennsylvania section. So I still run to this day and thankfully I'm in Pennsylvania and I can help self-police. It's getting a little tougher now that we're in 100 stores. But on the majority still, I'll go to the stores and every store is different. Some are fantastic, but majority of the stores We'll move those and put them back in the Pennsylvania stores, even after all of this now, or in the back Pennsylvania section. Um, so directly, this affects us from then getting our totals from the uh, of looking for more stores. And they say, well, you're not selling enough in these stores. And every stores that I go into to actually check on we're selling, there's always a, a section of the product's not displayed or it's put in the Pennsylvania section. So uh, the system can work. It's just a lot of policing of the own system and a bit burdensome on uh, small businesses. Yeah. Sorry if that was very long-winded here. <laughs> Representative Camp, did you have a second? Oh, Representative Burns. Oh, yeah. Um, thank you for testifying today. Um, I wanted to talk about if an entrepreneur was looking to open a distillery, what's the time frame, what's the minimum investment, and what advice would you offer them? Time frame on that from the time you're uh, actually planning till like total project fruition. Um, I think, uh, like most new entrants to the category, there's always hurdles that come up that I think are similar to any startup business. Uh, in general, you know, the licensing turnaround can be a little long compared for what it is. 
and quite honestly, most of the time they spend their entire time looking at um, a little bit more archaic stuff um, that it's readily available in electronic form. Um, timelines on that, I'd say, could vary anywhere from people as short as six months to a year and a half. Um, investment levels of that, I've seen everything from, you know, as small uh, as operations um, in other districts, maybe as low as a half a million all in, um, upwards of, uh, there was one recently, roughly about three or four million. And for myself, geez. <laughs> Uh, for myself, it was about a, a year and a half for us fully to uh, permitting took about six months or so to have all the checks and revisits gone over. And then we put in probably three quarters million to a million dollars to start. And then our biggest actually um, was the first year, which I didn't the first year expenses. Thankfully, we had the tasting room to float those expenses. But then just running and the price of grain and barrels and such uh, for operating costs. That was a big thing for us the first year of the additional amount of money coming in. Excellent. Thank you. Representative Camp. Jared, the, uh, I think as I understand the act, you're, you're permitted to have um, some of your products in, say, a tap room or uh, other locations that you don't own. Do you do, you do that? Is that useful? Yes, Martin. So um, especially in Phoenixville here with um, some of the other breweries and the wineries here, uh, having a great community, we're actually able to crisscross promotions. Um, so like the winery, some of the breweries as well, they offer now, um, like Koch Hockham's really uh, taken hold of um, doing some of our whiskeys, but they're offer, uh, able to offer beer and then a small amount of cocktails or something just for the person that's not looking to pull beer. And then also we're able to bring back, and actually now we have um, a small kegerator and have four taps on. And it's not a huge part of our business, but as the uh, Brewers Guild said earlier, it does make a big difference when that third person comes in and they're not looking for spirits and it is an option or that person that had a spirit or two just wants to relax for a little bit and have a glass of beer, we're able to offer other local products. Um, with that parity, the only thing I forgot to mention earlier, so uh, we have great parity between the, the sellers and wineries and breweries, but the other thing that Rob and I have been talking about a lot and had brought up is just uh, kind of making more of a parity between that and mainly in the source of hours. Um, all the hours kind of differ between the brewers and the distillers, but our main thing is that we have to close every single night at 11 p.m. And generally it's great up till Friday and Saturday where the local breweries in town and the wineries are allowed to open until 12 a.m. Um, so just that actual hour of time I've put in, in, into actually dollar points for myself, and that'd be a full employee salary I'd be able to pay just with, you know, two more hours a week open up on Fridays and Saturday nights. And just to capitalize, it's always kind of stinks for us having to close down and then kind of watch the crowd go somewhere else. So, thank you. Chairman Costa. Thank you. Um, you got me by the 11 o'clock rule. I wasn't aware of that, um, why you're treated differently. Um, but my question is, do either one of you use satellite locations? Yes, I currently do. Okay. I have a satellite location in Old City, Philadelphia. How and you're you? limited by statute, right? You can only have five. Five, five yeah. yeah. I, have um, one, I have one in Philadelphia, and I'm doing a second one right now in Old City, Philadelphia as well. Are you familiar with a company named um, Pennsylvania Libations? It's in Pittsburgh. Uh, have you yes. got either one of you taken advantage of that? I've chosen not to. Okay. Same here. I have I, I dabbled with it and chosen not to as well. Okay. Yeah. Is I don't mean to get into your business strategy, but is it a regional thing or it's just that you're not comfortable with someone else? For me, it was contracts. Okay. Same way I would look at a, a contract of any other wholesale to the rest of the United States. Okay. Yeah. Um, Sim similar for myself, um, being that I'd like to distribute myself or go through a distributor in Pittsburgh area, I didn't want to tie myself down to that certain individual. Okay. Just um, so some of the members and people in the audience understand, um, distillers are allowed to have up to five satellite locations. And there's a gentleman in Pittsburgh by the name of Christian Simmons who was pretty creative. Um, he's combined several different uh, distillers to be their satellite location. So he sells all Pennsylvania products, which is a pretty cool concept. Um, that he figured it out and he's being legit. Um, but I didn't know if there were other businesses in, at this area that do the same thing. Well, one of the things that we've spoken about, about the uh, one of our long-term initiatives of the Pennsylvania Distillers Guild is to actually have a uh, Distillers Guild retail shop using a similar model and licenses at the airports. 
Um, there's currently House, Sport, House Spirits in Portland, Oregon, actually has a nice retail shop that they currently do. And we had talked about doing um, something similar, but combining all of our resources to give a full kind of taste of Pennsylvania at the airport. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right, seeing no other questions, I will follow up with just one more. Are either or both of you sourcing your ingredients locally from PA? Yes. Yep, uh, Bucks County, Delaware County, Lancaster County. Uh, I think I got a batch of rye from Schuylkill last year. I do a mix. Uh, some I got from Lancaster and Bucks County, and then I pull some other grains from uh, the Midwest. So. Wonderful. That's, That's great fun. to hear. And for the members' information, we are trying to get a uh, tour this summer to go down and see Rob's operation. So if you could check your email and get back and let us know your availability, we'll try to make it down to Philadelphia this summer. You know, one other thing I'd like to tell you, another know, Representative Harris, and you talked about grains, again, a long-term initiative of the Guild. Um, being distillers, you know, distilled spirits are made from a vast array of raw materials. And being the rich agricultural state that Pennsylvania is, one of the long-term initiatives of the Pennsylvania Distillers Guild Agricultural Subcommittee is to work with various farmers around the state to be able to find a way over the next 10 years to make every single style of distilled spirit having an ingredient option being able to grow in within the state of Pennsylvania. And the reason that's such a long-term initiative is not only scaling up what you look from a grain perspective, but something as simple as juniper berries and gin. You know, to plant that bush, it takes you roughly three years to be able to get a uh, quality berry off of the bush. So it's a long-term objective for us to continue this movement and this symbiotic relationship with the others in the state. Excellent. Well, thank you very much for your feedback. We appreciate your participation. And next up, we have the Phoenixville Borough Manager, Gene Crack. Good afternoon, Gene. How are you? Very good. How about yourself? Uh, doing good. We were all commenting this is a beautiful borough building, and it's really well done and very nice. Thank you very much for allowing us to come. The floor is yours. You'll be in whenever you're ready. If you'd like, we could just open it to questions, or if you have if you have any sort of formal testimony. If not, we can just go straight to. I'm going to have formal. I'm more than, more than happy to answer a lot of questions that, that you have. Sure. So if you don't mind me asking, how long have you been borough manager? Um, ten years. Sir. Ten years. So just tell me a little bit about the transformation you've seen from ten years ago. How many breweries? How many there were here in Phoenixville, and what kind of that growth has has meant to the area? Well, I will tell you that uh, since 2004, uh, that's when the resurgence really took place here in the borough. Uh, there was just a couple of uh, restaurants and a couple of uh, uh, what would, I guess you would call them a, a bar versus a brewery. Uh, so there, was, there really wasn't a lot of places to go to. But the borough went through a process of uh, uh, starting with the streetscapes, starting with the cleanup of the town and what have you. Uh, and at that point, people started saying, you know, there's something going on here, but not quite sure exactly what it was. Um, cleanliness of the community, I think, was the very first thing that, that really made this, uh, the borough take off. And by about 2008, we had established the, uh, the streetscapes model that made it look a lot better than what it was, because this was a steel town and a steel town with very narrow streets and what have you with one linear street uh, for establishment. So it's not your typical place that you would think of that would have the growth such as a Westchester or a Norristown, a county seat for, uh, as an example. Uh, so we focused our energies on the, uh, the live and play side of things versus the, the work side of things. Uh, to make this a uh, place that felt very comfortable, uh, we redid our, our comprehensive plan, redid our zoning, uh, made it worthwhile for the development community to come to the borough. Uh, we invested in the borough ourselves. We built this building uh, to, uh, to anchor one end of the town versus the other end of the town. Uh, and what began to happen is uh, people said, well, can we do a, a fair, if you will, uh, um, a first Friday type of thing? And we went down that road of working with uh, uh, organizations to create that festive uh, uh, atmosphere for the, for the community. That, that festival orientation 
uh, allowed a couple of the establishments to exercise the option, I guess, to go out into the sidewalk or out into the street uh, uh, with the license, uh, however that works. Uh, that was sort of the, the genesis of what we currently have. Uh, that feeling of this is a great place to come to and, and enjoy yourself. Well, that population began to ask the question, well, you know, how, how can we live here? Uh, and so changing the dynamics of our, uh, our, our subdivision land development process and, and, and the like, lowering our fees as an example for development fees. Uh, developers will tell you they never see that. You lower your water uh, uh, hookup fees and your sewer hookup fees. It began to be the place where folks would um, be interested in, in doing the type of development that we have. With that development came the housing, and with that housing came the, 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 the folks who wanted something else to, to occur. What really set off uh, the borough, or I think at, at that point in time was the, uh, the Iron Hill had come in, which was the first brew your own product. Uh, and then um, uh, a little while later, uh, a Stable 12 came in, a Crowded Castle came in, uh, Concha Hawken came in, Bluebird came in, Black Walnut came in, uh, the Barrel came in, uh, Taste came in, uh, and all of those uh, folks had to have uh, uh, some sort of a license. Well, they were able to do that because I believe the, the LCB changed it or relaxed its rules, if you will, to allow that to happen. What we saw was interesting in that they're, they're not against each other. They work together. There's a there's a unique relationship that, uh, like restaurants or a restaurant row, these establishments are not threatened by each other. Um, and the, the fact that the, the laws were changed to allow that to happen has, has benefited this community to the point that since 2004, we've increased our uh, assessed valuation by $200 million, uh, about a 25% increase. And our population, uh, well over 3,000 with another 2,000 residential units being, uh, being planned. I literally just came up from a meeting uh, for a plan for 551 units right outside this building on the other side of the creek. That's all adjacent to the downtown, and so it's, it's, a, it's a synergistic relationship between the people being able to come home from work, park their cars, live and, and walk to these establishments. It's, it's what these, uh, uh, the, that's what everybody's looking for here. So uh, off of that, we also have uh, a, a community that, is, uh, that works with getting outside licenses. As you know, you, we, there's only so many licenses in the borough, so if something is not available, we're allowed to, uh, to entertain the idea from another establishment to bring one in from somewhere else in the county. And to my knowledge, in the time that I've been here, I think we've done seven of them. Uh, that's... I think that's pretty unique. I, I, I don't know the, the, the rules of, of our averages, but I think that's rather unique for a community this size. So I think that's the background. Uh, I'm more than happy now to you know, really answer questions on the things that I've just said. Sure. Um, sure, Representative Cannon. Hey, Gene. How you doing? I'm okay. And I, you know, you, uh, Described it um, obviously from personal experience. Um, just kind of, it, as you say it, you know, there's a, a proposal right outside these walls for 500 new units. I mean, for a very long time, as a number of people in this room know, including yourself, um, none of that was happening. And so, the um, I, I just, for my colleagues, I cannot emphasize. We, we are here in southeastern Pennsylvania. There is a lot of development, typically. There is a lot of um, economic activity, typically. But uh, for a very long time, uh, this community was um, not enjoying that. And that was not occurring. The closure of the, the steel and the manufacturing facilities uh, left a vacuum that for decades was unfilled. Um, so the... Um, the things that uh, the, the manager just described are um, very, very exciting to any person who has had a long-term connection to this community. Um, and, and to me, 
Iron Hill and, and uh, Stable 12 and a number of these other uh, places are kind of a, a new uh, phase or piece of the, of the blossoming of the community. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I have noticed that, and I would, that's why I was talking to the chairman about having a hearing down here. Gene, I guess my only question is, have you... Um, He's being humble when he says, talk to me about it. He's been asking me <laughs> consistently for eight straight months to please come and see what's going on in Phoenixville. Um, you know, is there, uh, is there some um, future for this that you see, how it may further unfold? Um, have there been some growing pains? Anything we, we might be able to work on that you've heard that perhaps the distiller or the... Um, the tasting rooms maybe wouldn't tell us that you can? <laughs> I don't think so. I, I, uh, I think, you know, we don't have very many places to go at this, at this juncture in our downtown. Our downtown is what it is. Uh, it's literally two and a half streets wide. It's Bridge Street and it's Church Street uh, with a little bit of uh, uh, Main and, uh, and, uh, and Gay Street. Uh, and that's really it. It, it. We're surrounded by residential and soon to be surrounded by more residential. Uh, so I think what, what we have is there room for, for more, a little bit, uh, but I think we're, we're reaching the, uh, the pinnacle of uh, our commercial growth. Uh, we just uh, uh, recommended Sedona Tap House to come uh, uh, to bring in a license from, from outside. I don't, I don't know where that's at at this juncture. Uh, but we're really filling in uh, the void, and, and that's really, uh, I mean, that's really where we're at. So uh, as it relates to our, if we have systemic problems, it's transportation. The roads are what the roads are, uh, and parking. Uh, that is, I, I hear more about parking than I do anything else, and we're trying to work uh, on that from, a, uh, from the developer side. But short of that, um, you know, I... I've, I've testified before, uh, along with the police chief, I mean, where, where do you hear a borough manager or a municipal manager and a police chief tell a judge in, in, in a courthouse that these things are really good for this borough? Usually we're, we're the ones trying to say, get somebody out because they're, they're a bad actor. Uh, that's not the case here. Uh, Coatesville and, and, uh, and here, both steel towns, and then you had the farming ag agrarian of the other two communities and how to turn those, uh, turn those around and, and what would do that. Uh, that also uh, uh, sort of piggybacked with a program that the county put together uh, that I've not seen anywhere around here, and that is they put a bond that uh, I believe was a $50 million bond that half of the money would go to support infrastructure improvements in the 16 urban centers of the 73 that are in, in uh, uh, Chester County. Uh, and then the other half of that funds would go to the agrarian side to uh, nurture um, uh, the buying of property to save it in, in that way. So not investing in infrastructure in the agrarian parts of the, uh, the, the county and in, in fact using those dollars to put in the infrastructure here, we've garnered uh, a lot, I think we're the largest community of receiving those funds and we invested that in uh, water and sewer infrastructure to encourage uh, that development. And then on our side, uh, took a very hard look at our, um, our, our permit process, our uh, water and sewer connection fees, because w water and sewer are a department here, so it's not an authority. So we have a lot of autonomy to be able to do those kinds of things. We put that into the to the package and then put a uh, alerta on the available land to uh, jumpstart that. The first two projects used alerta, and we saw the synergy that was going on with those projects and stopped alerta after that. So we didn't want it to carry on in perpetuity. We don't need it. We the development that is that I'm talking about across the street would have been eligible for LERTA, uh, they know it's gone and they're still coming here. And that's, I think that's part of what, how we did it, is, is we took all of the avenues we could, subdivision, land development, comp plan, zoning, all of it. $200 million in increased assessed property values is amazing. Um, the two biggest impediments that you had over that period of time, the two things, you two roadblocks that you had to overcome to get to this spot? 
Uh, I think it was leadership on the political level. Uh, I think the leadership got the message that was being said. And then the leadership gave me and my staff the ability to introduce these things and then supported us moving it forward. Um, this building was intended to be built in 2006 and they, they, the support just wasn't there. Um, we showed them that this was the right thing to do and in 2014 we moved into this building. Uh, that's the kind of support you need. You need it from you know, all eight members of your council, in our case, all eight members of council, uh, and the mayor helping to push the police department to do the things that we're suggesting that they do to support uh, the things that we're accomplishing. Uh, it's so a three-legged stool. Yeah, for sure. So we put to, our business association has got a lot of members right now in Pottsville. They, they uh, collected $30,000 to fund a, a, a study, revitalization study. We're going to roll it out. Uh, next Wednesday, actually, 7 o'clock in Pottsville. Uh, you're invited. Please come, come, and, <laughs> come and show us. Tell us more about what you've done. Th thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Tebash. That's interesting. I didn't realize until you geographically described it how small this borough is. What is your population? We are 17,300 wow. now. And with 2,000 residential units coming on board, if you did a 50% multiple, we're going to be over 20,000 in the next three to five years. Your job's going to get a little more difficult. It is. <laughs> Any other questions? I had the brown members? hair when I started. <laughs> <laughs> well, this has just been great. I, I, my only regret is I wish I would have seen Phoenixville 10 or 15 years ago because now it just seems like the norm for those of us that are here for the first time. But congratulations. It's a great story. Well, thank you. Thank you. Okay, our last panelist this afternoon is from the Regional Chamber of Commerce. I'd like to welcome Jessica, and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Good afternoon uh, to the Liquor Control Committee. We sincerely appreciate the opportunity to testify on the successes seen within the additions of the breweries, distilleries, and wineries to Phoenixville. Uh, as mentioned, my name is Jessica Capistran. I'm the President and CEO of the Phoenixville Regional Chamber of Commerce. I'd like to give a bit of background on the chamber to provide this committee with a better understanding of our place within the Phoenixville community. Our organization will celebrate its 90th anniversary next year, and in those years, the chamber has evolved a number of times to serve the community in different ways. In my seven years with the chamber, we have focused on offering many networking events as well as becoming highly involved in the community events. In 2017, the Chamber organized nearly 100 events for our members and our community. And just last week, uh, the Chamber hosted its annual awards dinner, which honored three of the breweries um, you've likely heard from today, uh, including Crowded Castle, Conchahawken Brewing, and Root Down Brewing Company, for their aesthetic improvements, uh, their interest in civic and community affairs, and their impact on our regional economy. We feel that collaborating with others gives us all a chance to get creative. And one of our most treasured partnerships is with Phoenixville First, a local cooperative of leaders that focuses on a more comprehensive marketing program for the borough. Phoenixville First houses the First Friday and food truck programs, as well as the summer music series. The Phoenixville community has changed and grown in a number of ways. We have witnessed an increase in our population, as well as in the number of our businesses. The vacancy rate in our downtown is now under 8% in storefronts as we continue to garner a diverse and cultural surge in owner-occupied businesses. There has also been an increase in the number of business owners that own their building or are working towards ownership at this time. When discussing these new businesses, we must recognize that, part and thanks to this committee, Phoenixville is bearing witness to the influx of craft alcohol establishments. Craft alcohol has proven itself as an industry and draws folks of diverse backgrounds together. Craft alcohol has also shown to bring higher income residents and visitors and larger disposable incomes. There have also been several partnerships within the Phoenixville business community, including a stout or bourbon infused handmade marshmallow you can find at Bridge Street Chocolates and finding local bottles or brews on top are on tap rather at restaurants and bars, and of course the, the flight of the Phoenix, which is a crawl through our craft scene. Creating craft alcohol to the extent that our breweries, distilleries, and wineries have requires major investments in equipment, in space, 
and staffing and more. Those in Phoenixville have taken many creative approaches to ensure that their patrons have a great experience. And as you may have heard today, um, or prior to today, Phoenixville now boasts the number one spot in the state and number 10 nationally for craft alcohol businesses per capita. As we know, Phoenixville's foundry produced steel that supports structures around the world. And now we can take pride in the job creation found in craft alcohol, as well as pride in something that is made in Phoenixville. The chamber embraces this idea and has spoken with a number of uh, the businesses on creating tours and an informational website. This type of development re-energizes downtowns like ours and can certainly benefit the businesses around it uh, as we incorporate the tourism side of this industry. We very much appreciate the efforts of this committee to improve the legislative environment for those in the production and sale of craft alcohol and will gladly work alongside all efforts to continue the growth and positive response that has added to our community. Thank you. Thank you very much. Questions from the members? Chairman Costa. Thank you. Um, I'd like to know a little bit more about the flight of the Phoenix. Could you tell us about sure. that? Who doesn't? There's some guys in here today too that could tell you much more uh, of the within the ownership of those businesses. But. Um, a couple of years ago, those uh, who were established in the community, uh, which included Bluebird and, and Stable 12, who, you, who are here today, um, partnered with the wineries and uh, any other breweries, Iron Hill, et cetera, that um, offer a craft scene. And so they put an event together where uh, you would visit um, each location for a certain amount of time, and at the end, in completing it, you, uh, you get a stamp each location and you get a T-shirt at the end. So it's like a passport? Sort yes. Of? Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Representative Kampf. So Jessica, um, there are some new uh, apartments that have been built in the borough right on Bridge Street and then over, um, so that's off of what's main. Mm -hmm. uh, can you talk about uh, that? Is that um, connected at all with this development of craft alcohol? I think so. I think those types of development really do complement each other and work together. So, of course, the hope is when you create a business that those folks living in those communities will, in fact, support them, right? So I do think we see that. Um, I know both apartment communities have worked to put together their own sort of uh, nights out at these different breweries uh, throughout the community. And uh, I know, for example, the toll development that is along Main Street, they actually have a tap inside the clubhouse, which they um, have only been using local breweries to fill that tap for social events that they put on. Um, and there does tend to be a big push to support local within um, those apartment developments. And I think that um, seeing that much development, of course, makes it much more attractive for people to turn the key and say, yes, I'm going to start a business. We're going to make this um, very large investment. And um, just two other things. Do you have any sense of of why craft alcohol happened to kind of blossom here? Um, and uh, and and then are there developments down the road that you see perhaps happening um, in the borough that are related to it? And sure. I don't, when I say developments, I don't mean buildings. I just mean things that might happen, events or whatnot. Absolutely. I think, um, okay, so to address the, the first part of that question, um, I think, of course, legislatively, which of course comes all the way down to the borough level, there has to be um, a sense of openness there uh, to drive this into town. Um, and I think that the borough, uh, from any feedback I've received, has been extremely cooperative with wanting to see these you know, businesses invest. Um, and again, many, a few of which have worked to purchase their buildings or you know, are considering that for the future, which is, again, another major investment and I think says a lot about the community and um, you know, that pulse that they're getting with local leadership to say, okay, we're going to continue to support this. Um, I also think that 
you know, not being met with opposition from organizations like the chamber or, again, the municipality to say this isn't something that we want in town. You know, that didn't happen at any point on that level. Um, and we've just continued to push and say, you know, this sort of development should be embraced. Um, if everybody just comes here and opens up shop and nobody's working together and there's no plan to, again, you know, uh, for example, the Flight of the Phoenix event, that helps to create a tie between all of them. Um, the Chamber certainly wants to help, and, and I know that even at a, um, a county visitors bureau level, they're interested in, you know, creating a brewery culture um, in the county and kind of see us as the, the figurehead for that. So I think sort of all the stars are aligning and um, because so many people find Phoenixville interesting for so many different reasons, it, it just creates that environment that, you know, makes it an easier decision. In your experience, how long have you been head of the chamber, if you don't mind me asking? Sure, seven years. Seven, is there any friction points um, between the businesses and any form of government? I know like in the capital city of Harrisburg, there's issues with bar and restaurant owners and parking. Um, the parking enforcement got much more aggressive. It went till 7 p.m. and it kind of affected their business. In other areas of the state, you'll hear about high water or sewer or, you know, it's kind of sometimes there's regional problems. Is there anything that you feel is impeding future growth? I think, um, to use your point, I'm sure everyone in this room would say parking is a challenge, um, particularly Thursday, Friday, and Saturday nights. Um, I think that, you know, from the, the chamber standpoint, which again, you know, we hear about these sorts of things a little more often because we do have a good relationship with our municipality. Um, there have been efforts, there, have been, had, there has been a parking study performed to find out um, exactly what our shortages are and uh, which of course are all things needed in order to apply for any sort of funding um, through a bank, bonding, et cetera. And um, I do think that the municipality is making efforts um, towards that, as well as uh, bringing in the wayfinding for parking. Um, but I, I do think that there's, uh, you know, all of us wish that there was more parking, particularly for those three days of the week. Um, I also will say that uh, when I arrived about seven years ago, that was just at a point that they were starting to enforce uh, parking. So. 10 years ago, businesses were complaining that cars were sitting in front of their location for 10 days at a clip and, you know, um, folks couldn't get in to park in front of them or anywhere near them. So it's a double-edged sword and uh, we're sort of, you know, almost a victim of our own success with the parking problem. But I do think, um, and we encourage businesses to continue to chime in on what exact issues they're having and when, um, and so we can come up with maybe some more creative partnerships. Representative Stats. Thank you, Chairman Harris, and thank you, Jessica, for joining us today. Uh, being from Bucks County, I'm familiar with the area. I have not been in Phoenixville since the 90s, so it was certainly an eye-opener. Oh Thanks for coming. Certainly yeah. an eye-opener as I drove into town today. <laughs> yeah. But I heard a couple of things today that with the influx of the craft beer establishments, or the craft alcohol establishments, that uh, you're drawing from a larger demographic, an expanded demographic. Yes. Have you identified where they're, where they're coming from? Sure, which I'll be honest is, is mostly from feedback that we get from uh, restaurants and breweries uh, wineries, distilleries, et cetera, and um, those who actually communicate with the chamber. We do receive actually phone calls or, or uh, messages into our social media about people coming into town. And uh, it, it used to be, right, that you'd only ever hear from people if they were upset about something, but we actually have gotten a lot of um, positive feedback. Uh, it seems that within the county, uh, we're getting individuals off Westchester um, there's definitely a surge of people coming from that area. Wilmington, Delaware as well. Um, parts of Delaware County, um, it, like through Valley Forge, Oaks, and into Delaware County, Devon, uh, Wayne. And while we don't have major transportation to host people most commonly from the city, we, we do have people moving from the city. So those who may still have friends or family that lives in the city of Philadelphia do certainly come out here for the urban, suburban <laughs> experience. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. um, 
I think we heard today that there's about a population of 17,000 in Phoenixville. Yes. Um, any idea of how many food and beverage establishments that you have? Yeah, so pretty much within the downtown, there are about 55 to 60 businesses at this point in time. In terms of restaurant and bar, that's going to be about 60% of that number. Um, we do, as, as many people will notice, um, we do have a number of places to eat. <laughs> so uh, that does tend to take up the majority yeah. of yeah, our downtown. Very impressive. Well done. Yeah, thanks. It is very impressive. Thank you very much for your testimony. <laughs> thank you. And thank with you that, we will wrap up the public hearing. Thank you, thank you to the members and for everyone who came to testify. And the meeting is adjourned.